It's a pleasure to introduce our uh, special guest. He spoke yesterday uh, at the Denver Forum. In my absence, the District Attorney of Denver, Mitch Morrissey, introduced him. While he was speaking, a member of the Forum was sending me text messages rating his performance. Basically, she said, oh my God, he's fantastic. We like to hear that, and that'll be the response today. Um, I read his column. I agree almost all the time, uh, which means I agree with him more often than I do my wife, so this is not insignificant. Um, I think in the world of foreign policy knowledge and expertise, there's just no one better. Why he is not at the White House is really an indictment against this administration. He's incredibly bright. The book is A Handful of Bullets, Archduke Ferdinand's Assassination, and the Consequences, which live with us yet today. Welcome, please, from the Atlantic Council, the very great Dr. Harlan Ullman. George, thank you. A stunning uh, introduction. I am very, very grateful. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, we had a chance to address the students today, and uh, I was very, very much impressed, and I will know that the future will be, if it's in your hands, well looked after. I'd also like to introduce a couple of special friends here, Admiral Bud Edney. Uh, Bud not only threw 387 missions over Vietnam, but more importantly, he sunk a 90-foot putt at Pinecrest Country Club in <laughs> Idaho Falls to take $50 out of my pocket, and I will never forgive him for that. Uh, Phil Marsden, Jim Fontana, and Max Ricketts were classmates of mine at the uh, School for Bad Boys at Annapolis, and if I look as good as they do, I'm going to be really quite uh, happy with that. Let me begin my remarks by uh, making a, an observation. Um, <clears throat> you all probably know of John Warner, who was a famous senator chairman of the Armed Services Committee for many years, a graceful man who's now 90. But John's greatest achievement might have been being the sixth or seventh husband of Elizabeth Taylor, depending upon how you count Richard Burton. And John liked to observe that uh, he knew what he had to do on his wedding night, but could he make it interesting? And I will see if I can make it interesting for you today. Um, why would anybody in their right mind write a book about the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie, on June 28, 1914 in Sarajevo? There are probably have been over a million books, articles, pieces, so forth and so on. So what's different? And what provoked me to write this book was, I don't want to say a recurring nightmare, but three questions that kept me up at night. First, why has the United States lost every war it has started? Second, why do we elect presidents in the last three who were never prepared and ready for the job when they took office? And thirdly, why is it that members of Congress are allowed to vote on bills that they have never read and do not understand? And if you think I'm joking, that's the truth. And so I began looking at World War I through the eyes and suggestion of President Dwight Eisenhower, who said, if you have a difficult problem, try to expand it. Now, we all know that World War I, precipitated by the assassination, laid the seas for World War II and the Cold War. But when you stand back, it struck me that there were other broader consequences. Now, what was the cause of this consequence, of these consequences, was the acceleration of two powerful forces. First, globalization, which is interconnectivity among and between states. And second, the diffusion of power. And by that I mean economic power, military power, political power over the years. It has had three consequences in terms of empowering groups, individuals, non-state actors at the expense of the Westphalian state system that's been in existence since 1648 in which states were the center of power. That is being eroded. Second, we have created, knowingly or not, too many archdukes, that is, potential trouble spots that could explode. And on top of that, we got more bullets than we know what to do with, metaphorically. And by the way, you don't have to fire a bullet at an archduke to get a kill. A poor Tunisian fruit vendor lit himself a fire and the Arab awakening broke out. But thirdly and most importantly, these consequences <clears throat> have spawned 
four new horsemen of the apocalypse that menace society at large. And this is really the <clears throat> overriding conclusion of my book. The first horseman is failed or failing government. And we see that from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe with Washington and Brussels in between. Washington is badly broken, badly broken. And it may well be the reason that it is broken is that a system of checks and balances invented by the best minds of the 18th century no longer can tolerate the rigors of the 21st century. But unless or until we can be able to deal with failed and failing government, we're not going to be successful here. We're not going to be successful in places from Iran to Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria to Somalia. And it's going to make life very difficult. Now, I'm not suggesting any kind of an apocalyptic view. The United States is not going to be overtaken by China. We're not going to implode. But unless we fix failed and failing government, your generation, you in the, la in the back rows, and future generations are going to find your standards of living eroded, you're going to find your expectations muted, and you're going to find America will not be quite the place it once was for your parents and grandparents. And if we don't seize this opportunity, it's our fault. Second, horsemen, is economic despair, disparity, and dislocation. If you're living around the world, you cannot survive on $2 a day. In the United States, I'm sure you are all aware of the disparities between rich and poor and the erosion of the middle class, which means that there's been a huge disparity in income and wealth distribution, which a dem democratic society can only tolerate for so long. Thirdly is rabid, rabid, violent ideology in the form of radical Islam, and I will use that term, in which an ideology is exploiting a religion for political purposes. And if you want an analogy, this is what Lenin was able to do turning Russia into the Soviet Union in 1917 using communism as his overriding mechanism, what Hitler was able to do with fascism in Germany. And what you're seeing in the Islamic State, which I prefer to call enemies of Islam, or even more to the point, the Black Death, because like the plague of the Middle Ages, these people come from the Middle Ages, they're medieval, and they could be as deadly, and we have to deal with it. And fourth and finally is environmental calamity, whether it's a pandemic of Ebola, whether it's measles, whether it's bizarre weather conditions where you have flooding and drought out here on the West Coast, you have tens of feet of snow in the East Coast, global warming, climate change, all these things could be the black swan that could have tremendous impact. Now, what do we do about this? And the last third of my book is very, very prescriptive. It also includes a chapter on cyber, because I think it's very important. And one of the problems we face, face with cyber is that we don't have overarching <coughs> constructs to deal with cyber, as we did, for example, dealing with nuclear deterrence. And until we get that, cyber will always be a huge problem. And I also have a chapter on the financial crisis of 2007-2008. And why I really like that study, and you need to know that part of my professional life is in the world of banking and investment, but it shows how problems accumulate over time, which is a very, very good analog from the Archduke's assassination and how these problems have accumulated and metastasized. You may find this hard to believe, but the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 had its roots in 1907 with a financial crisis then in the United States, which in 1908 led to the abrogation and the illegalization of credit, de credit default swaps. And if those of you don't know what credit default swaps are, what they mean is that you can bet your money on other people's money without having to own anything. And they were made legal in 1999, and from there, with the abrogation of Glass-Steagall, which in, 19, in reaction to the Depression of 1929 and 1933 separated investment from merchant banking. These became the catalyzing forces for so-called weapons of financial mass destruction. And I like the analogy because things don't happen overnight. They are causal, and it gives people good reason to look at history as a way of understanding better the consequences and the causes.
because one of the problems we face today in the United States is that we're very good at dealing with symptoms. President W. Bush declared a war on terror. Mr. Obama has declared a war on the Islamic State. But we're dealing with the symptom. Terror is not a cause. It is a tool, a tactic, and a symptom. And until we start dealing with causes, we're never going to be able to get ahead. You don't cure, cure con cancer with aspirin. And in essence, that's what we're doing. Now, what are some recommendations that can be done to deal with these four horsemen? First, how do we get back away from a system of politics that is no longer directed towards good governance, but being elected and reelected? That's what elections are about. That's what politics are about. You've got two parties that are ideologically driven by the extremes in which compromise is really almost impossible to get. And by the way, negative campaigning has reached a fine art. Now, I'm not so naive to think that negative campaigning is new. George Washington was attacked in the most vile ways. Abraham Lincoln was called the most vile things. People hated FDR. But because negative campaigning has reached such a point, now you're either with us or against us, and every issue is life or death, no matter how important or unimportant it is. Keystone Pipeline, on a scale of 1 to 100, it's probably a 5 or a 6. It probably is better if we get it, and it's something we probably should do. But it's not the end of the world if we don't, and it's not going to destroy the world if we do. But we can't put politics on an even keel. So how do we fix these kinds of things? And I have a lot of, a lot of recommendations, but I'll just hit some of the most important and then respond to your questions. First, we need universal voting, mandatory voting. Everybody needs to go to the poll. Now, whether they vote or not is up to them. Right now, as George said, a very relatively small percentage of society votes. In presidential elections, it's somewhere between 50 and 55 percent. That means tens of millions of Americans are absent. Now, if you had to go to the polls, it would have several effects. First, it would very much neutralize the wings of both parties. I'm sure many of you remember the 2012 Republican fight for the campaign and how everybody was forced to the right wing. And whatever you think of Mitt Romney, it forced Romney to be more extreme and probably helped him to lose the election. You would mitigate the effect of both wings. Second, you would mitigate the effects of money. There's not enough money to influence 200 million, 240 million Americans who are going to vote. Thirdly, and most importantly, I think it would attract more Americans to become engaged in the political system. I have great faith in the common sense of Americans. And I believe if you had to go to the polls in countries like Australia and Switzerland do, where they have over 90 percent, then I think you would have more Americans engaged. Now, some of you can argue, well, look, Americans are going to be lazy. They're not going to want to vote. They may vote in herd mentalities. I have a higher opinion of Americans. But the only way we can do this, and you don't need a constitutional amendment, you have to go to your state or local authority, get a driver's license, you have to register for Social Security, uh, you've got to register, you've got to pay your taxes. There are all sorts of mandatory things that society requires. And so going to the polls, it seems to me, is one. Second, the 22nd Amendment of the Constitution precludes a president from serving more than two elected terms. I would abrogate that. If you have a president who is experienced, and I argue our last three presidents did not enter office experienced enough, and however bad George W. Bush was, and however expenses, expensive his tuition and learning were, at the end of the sixth or seventh year, he was a pretty good president. My point is, if you have a president who's experienced, why force them out of office if they could have a third term? And elect elections will determine that. Next, I would extend the length of office and term of members of the House of Representatives to four years. Two years is absurd. Once they get in, all they're doing is running to raise more money, and they cannot govern. And you take a look. What does everybody do? They're gone. When is Congress in session? Tuesday to Thursday. Now, maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe if they're only in session one day a week, it would be better. But the point is, you know, you get the government, you pay for, and I think four years is about right. Finally, I would have a Sarbanes-Oxley law for Congress. For those of you who don't know Sarbanes-Oxley, in wake of all the financial scandals of Enron, MCI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it, 10 or 15 years ago, Congress passed a law in which basically a CEO was accountable for everything he or she signed. So when he submitted 
the annual reports, the income tax filing, the SEC Securities and Exchange Commission filings, he had to certify, she had to certify that these were accurate. And if they were not, they'd go to jail. Now, I would make a Sarbanes-Oxley saying that every member of Congress has to certify before they vote on a bill that they have read or understood it. Now, I guarantee you that all 535 members of Congress would say, that's absurd, we can't run things that way. Well, I'll tell you, I'm on the board of a couple of public companies, and if the CEO said the same thing, I just cannot be bothered by reading all this stuff, we'd fire him, or the shareholders would fire him, or we'd go to jail. And so I think you've got to hold Congress to the same level of accountability we hold everybody else. About the economic issues, we need to form a national infrastructure bank immediately. I live in a fourth world city, Washington, D.C. We live in Georgetown, and right behind us in one of the streets, there's a pothole that's so deep, I think it goes to China. We need to fix our infrastructure. 30 years ago, the Center for Strategic International Studies released a report that said our electrical power grid is vulnerable and cannot last another 10 years. Okay, it has, but it's gotten worse. You're all familiar with fracking and all the benefits we're going to get. There's one problem. How are you going to get that natural gas outside the country? Trucks don't drive very well over the oceans, and there's only one port that's right now capable of taking those ships. We need to fix our internet. We need to fix our schools. So an infrastructure project is really critical. And the way to do it, in my mind, is to finance it with a bond offering. Now, American companies are keeping something on the order of $2 trillion abroad for tax purposes because our tax laws are nuts. And when all of you in the back get old enough to file your income tax statements, I defy you to tell me you know what you're signing because every year when I sign mine, I don't have a clue what I'm signing because I don't understand it. But you can bring that money back under the scheme without tax consequences and invest it in the National Infrastructure Bank at, say, 2% above prime. You also get American private citizens to buy bonds, 30-year bonds, same deal, 2% over prime, which would be paid for by user fees, tolls, uh, increases in electrical charges, so forth, that would be generated by this infrastructure project. And it would be putting in place not only employment for potentially tens of millions of people, but more importantly, it would put in place the infrastructure that this country needs to compete in the 21st century. Regarding radical Islam, like some of us in the audience, Vietnam was our war, and we didn't have a clue about Vietnam. We didn't understand the culture, we didn't understand the politics, we didn't understand the society. We repeated that when we went into Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. First of all, I argue that we need to have a revolution in military education and security education for those serving so that we have better understanding of the cultures of different parts of the world. We give it lip service and we don't do that right. Second, we need a comprehensive strategy. Um, in any organization to be successful, you've got to have somebody in charge. You have to have a table of organization, who does what to whom. You have it here at your school, you understand who the teachers are, you understand the rules of the game, you have exams, you've got papers, you've got homework assignments. Question. Who in Washington is in charge of the fight against the Islamic State? Please tell me. Please tell me. And among the coalition of 62 who are meeting right now in Saudi Arabia and the sub-coalition of 20, tell me who's in charge. Tell me who is responsible for taking on the insurgents. Tell me who's responsible for stabilization. Tell me who's responsible for dealing with the ideological fight. And tell me who's responsible for cutting off money to the bad guy. Tell me. And tell me who's showing oversight. And if that's not enough, tell me what the authority is of General John Allen, retired Marine, who has become the President's special envoy to the coalition. What is he capable of doing? What is he not? Does he have any power and authority? And the answer to those questions are not very satisfactory. So you're going to take on the bad guys. You need to put somebody in charge who knows what he or she is doing and empower them to do it. And we haven't done that. That's the first order of magnitude. Second, we need to work in the Gulf Cooperative Council, the six countries in that part of the world, to build a kind of a NATO, a North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that's more than a little grouping and more of a security arrangement because it's up to that part of the world to deal with their problems. We cannot do it for them, and we should not do it for them.
it's up to them. And we have not been dynamic enough. It's almost banal to say we haven't shown the leadership, but we haven't been aggressive enough in pursuing that. And then we have to have a far more aggressive policy taking on the ideological arguments that are being used by uh, the enemies of Islam, also known as the Islamic State. During World War II, Churchill was brilliant, referring to Hitler repeatedly as that little corporal and the Nazis as Nazis. He was insulting in the extreme to delegitimize them. So why are we not delegitimizing these people who are evil, who believe that killing infidels is good, who have this fictitious, fictitious notion of the past, which they don't understand, and this imagination of the future that they're never going to achieve, but which is very attractive to lots of people who are cut off, who are disenfranchised, or have other grievances. And the fact is, we are told there are at least 20,000 foreign fighters in Syria. Now, if you take the Muslim population of about 1.4 or 1.5 billion, and you assume one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent could be radicalized. That's bigger than the U.S. military. That is a lot of people, especially if you go back to my argument that power has, has diffused to individuals and small groups. Look at Edward Snowden releasing the NSA secrets. Look at Bradley or Chelsea Manning, however you want to refer to him or her, and the damage that WikiLeaks leaks have done. And look what happened with the massacre in France of Charlie Hebdo, in which 12 people were killed and then four more were killed uh, in a kosher delicatessen, compared with 20 kids who were killed at Sandy Point. Think of the impact of that. It's almost a trivial. I'm not demeaning the fact that 12 people were killed, but that's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount to have this kind of impact. And think about the impact of the film of burning the Jordanian pilot alive. Now, what's interesting Anybody in this room seen that film, that video? What's interesting is that three quarters of it show Arabs and Sunnis being blown up, burned to death by US drones and airstrikes from the coalition. And so by the time you get to looking at this Jordanian pilot horribly killed, many Arabs say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And if you look at the surveys, that video, however distasteful it is in the West, is viewed entirely differently <clears throat> in the Arab and Muslim world. We don't understand that. And so we need to have a far stronger policy dealing with this ideologically. Now, in 2004, the Defense Science Board, which consists of very, very, very bright and talented people in the Department of Defense, civilian board, wrote a report for then Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld in which the chairman of the Defense Science Board, Bill Snyder, said in the opening page, and I suggest you Google it and look at Defense Science Board of July 2004, in which the first page of this report, which Rumsfeld said, tell me how we're doing in the war on terror. And Snyder wrote, in the war on terror, we are losing the battle of ideas. And unless we win the war on ideas, we're going to lose the war on terror. That was 11 years ago, and we haven't done very, very much to do that. So we need to get organized to do it. I fear that's not going to be the case. Now, what does that mean? I'm not suggesting that the end is coming. That's not going to happen. Worst case, if the Islamic State continues and takes over more territory, we can contain and isolate it. It will be a growing threat, but it's not the end of the world. We'll be able to deal with it in the future, but dealing with it right now would be much better. We will also lose all sorts of opportunity costs, and it's rather like World War II. It took a long time for us to get in, and then we had to recapture all that territory in the Pacific and all of Europe. Now, I'm not suggesting that's going to be a replay in the future, but unless we act now, it's going to cost us a great deal more in the future. Um, let me conclude with what I hope is a far more <clears throat> optimistic note. Democracy <clears throat> is about involvement of people. If the public does not involve itself, we're going to lose our democracy. Now, our generation, my generation, basically has made a hash of things. We have not done what we should have done. And it's the future generation here that is going to have on its shoulders huge responsibility. 
And it's very interesting, and it's very easy for me to say it's on your shoulders now, but it is. And why I am far more optimistic in the past is because your generation, and I'm talking about kids who are 18, 19, and younger. I shouldn't say kids, people. Um, <clears throat> you are far more savvy and sophisticated than many of us in the room today, and certainly at your age. And why? Because you understand how to use this. And by this, I mean the Internet. You understand these things, and the Internet is very sophisticated, as you all know. You can deal with these apps in many, many ways. The story not very long ago of a 15-year-old English chap was awarded $20 million to sell his application. So you have the capacity <clears throat> through the Internet and your skills that you may not appreciate that you have fully developed yet, but you have the capacity to see the world far differently. I'll give you a further example. My generation, homosexuality was something that was seen as taboo. I don't have any children. The only reference I have is to my wife's grandchildren and my nieces and nephews. And when you raise the issue of homosexuality, they wonder, what are you talking about? It's not a deal. I mean, what, what's the big deal here? And so there's been a huge and positive transformation. I think the younger generation comes because of the Internet, its exposure to it, its exposure to more things, and its ability to think in far different and more open ways. There's going to be huge advantage. And my guess is that 20 or 30 years from now, it's going to be your generation with the new versions of Microsoft, of Apple, of Facebook, of Twitter, that are going to be able to turn things around. And while some of us are not going to be here, <clears throat> um, we will be very glad that you will be able to do what you've done. With that, I'd like to answer your questions, comments, and other things. Mr. Kruger of NBC. Um, drawing on your study of history, I wonder if you could help me understand. Could you hear in the back? Uh, sorry. My fault. <coughs> uh, drawing on your is that good? Yeah. Yep. drawing on your understanding of history, could you uh, help us understand in the last <coughs> couple of days in light of these atrocities committed by ISIS? I've heard several people say, well, they're not the existential threat that Nazi Germany was. And um, I don't know, that to me, this is a very yeah. scary situation. Can you explain why that is? Yeah. <coughs> if I get over this coughing fit. Um, I think the Obama administration, and I will, I will, I will be slightly cynical in this response, views ISIS, the Islamic State, the enemies of Islam, more like the hula hoop, and that it will fall of its own weight. And I think they are prepared to cede the battlefield right now to Iran and the Shia. Iraq and the Shia are doing pretty well against the Islamic State. And I think Obama feels, don't do stupid stuff. Let them move ahead so we don't have to become involved. And there's, a, there's an argument to that degree. I do not know whether the Islamic State is going to be a Lenin or a Hitler or Soviet Union or a uh, Nazi party. But I do know enough to say we cannot take that chance. And so I would not view it as a hula hoop. I would hope that that might happen. But I would be far more determined and using smart ways to go after these guys. And I go back to this notion of negative campaigning. We are brilliant at it. The Bush administration in South Carolina in 2000 accused John McCain of, wedding, of, of having a black child out of wedlock, which was a Sri Lankan orphan that he and Cindy adopted on the spot in Sri Lanka when they saw her. Why don't we take that kind of bad advertising and apply it against the bad guys? They've got 90,000 hits a day on Twitter. Why don't we start broadcasting some stuff to really turn it against us, against them? Why, for example, has the president not yet met uh, with King uh, Salman of Saudi Arabia again and said, look, you guys have got to do more heavy lifting? Quite frankly, we were so obsequious and deferential when we attended uh, Abdullah's 
funeral, I think we should have been more aggressive. And quite frankly, God bless Michelle Obama for not wearing a headscarf. I like that. I mean, it did a lot of negative things in Saudi Arabia, but we have to be a lot tougher. I don't think the administration has that particular toughness yet. Um, I cannot guarantee you that this is going to be an existential threat. It's an existential threat in the region, and the region has to understand that. And if the region doesn't understand that, there's very, very little we can do because we're not going to send 200,000 more troops forever into Iraq. That's not going to happen. There is a plan B, and I just am not confident that the administration has a plan B. What worries me is their campaign plan right now is a wish and a promise, and it's on paper, but is not being executed right. And so, yes, it's a big problem. Let's stop it now and not let it disintegrate in the future. But I'm at odds with the administration on this and many other things, if that answers Dr. your question. Dr. Platten, uh, thank you for throwing out so many provocative ideas. And just to pick on one, mandatory voting seems yeah. like a good idea, but it brings to mind the old saying, you can lead a horse to water but can't make it drink. Yeah. You can force people to vote, but you can't force them to do <coughs> their homework. And, and if they don't do their homework, or are they going to be able to help us get to reason solutions? It's a problem. It could be that way. I, I have a greater, I have got a greater sense of common sense of people to do the right thing. And they're not forced to vote. They've got to show up at the polls. And I assume if they go to the polls, they're going to vote. And you've got a younger generation here, when they get to be 18 or 21, to be able to vote. They are far more aware. And I think that the notion here is that you say to Americans that you've got to show up at the polls. I think a large majority would say, okay, I'm going to take that responsibility seriously. And by the way, you've got to get the political leadership behind this. It's going to require a president to stand up and not just once make a speech. It's going to be required inoculation in which we have a mandatory, uh, I shouldn't say mandatory, but a repeated way of saying how important it is for Americans to become more involved in what George is doing. And it's starting in bits and pieces. Uh, my great friend Colin Powell has got a school named after him at CCNY, which is developing the young leaders. John McCain, as the McCain uh, Center, at uh, Arizona State University doing the same thing. And I'm sure there are lots of other institutions that are doing it. This is happening in di different bits and pieces, but we have to have a much more collective activity so that this branches out and encourages people to take a more active interest in their government, because that's what democracy is about. And if we don't, then we get the government we deserve, and right now that government is flawed, failing, and broken. Well, first of all, we've got to get King Salman of Saudi Arabia and the leading mullahs and ayatollahs to stand up much more and declare fatwas against what's going on among the Sunnis in the Islamic State. Boom. We have to have a far broader propaganda campaign. I'm talking about propaganda campaign, which we don't have, to fight the ideas. During the Cold War, we had Radio Free Europe. We were able to taunt the Soviets, drove them crazy. Ronald Reagan was great at that. Tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, all right? Who's made the equivalent statement to Baghdadi to do something? And we haven't engaged our allies as much as we have to, <clears throat> including Russia, and I'm happy to answer questions about Ukraine. But we haven't done that, and that's what we need to do. We need much, much more force. We have got to be the catalyst. And I have no dis disagreement. If Mr. Obama wants to lead behind, that's great. But I want him to lead. And we've got to motivate. And we can't do it ourselves. I made the comment about Mounties never send a man where you can send a bullet. We've got to engage other people. But Franklin Roosevelt was brilliant at doing that before World War II, encouraging the British and being able to support them. We need that type of leadership. And if we don't get it, it's going to be disastrous for that part of the world. We can survive. But we're going to have to come at it again in the future, and that's going to be far more expensive than if we take better action today. And I'm not talking about deploying military forces. I have no problem with airstrikes, but you don't win a war with airstrikes. I mean, I wish we would learn that lesson. And we're not going to put lots of soldiers on the ground. I think special forces and selective forward air observers, we can do that. But we've got to get other people, and I would want the Gulf to come up with an Arab army. Even, even if they don't deploy it, if they have an Arab force that's there, that sends a signal. But the poor Sunnis who are being occupied by 
the enemies of Islam, the Islamic State, have nowhere to turn, and they don't see anybody who's riding to their rescue. And that's something that we need to do. Now, having made a mess in Iraq, it may be too late to rally the Sunnis. The leading sheikhs in Anbar, many have been killed. Sheikh Lawrence, whose grandfather named him for Lawrence of Arabia because his grandfather actually worked with Lawrence of Arabia in the, Arab, in the, in the peninsula, was killed in a car blast several weeks ago. So the Sunnis are losing their leadership and they're losing their patience. It may be too late in that regard, but we've got to mobilize the Arabs. Let me give you another really outrageous comparison. Unfair, I'm going to make it. Seven months after Pearl Harbor, we had a strategy, we had a campaign plan, we had El Alamein, we had Midway and Stalingrad, and we turned the tide of war, World War II. Seven months after Obama has declared a war on IS, we don't have an operational strategy, we don't have a coalition, we don't have a leadership, and we haven't done really very much except fly airstrikes. And quite frankly, those airstrikes were largely flown in support of, of Kobani. Um, and we've really made not as much of an impact on the bad guy's leadership as the administration would had you lead, believe, because you kill one and guess what? A couple more pop up. So we've got to be more serious and we've got to be more determined. And I'm afraid I'm uh, whistling past the graveyard. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. On behalf of my uh, European history students, you mentioned the Westphalian system yep. and having studied the Thirty Years' War and the Treaty of Westphalia. I was hoping that maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how that system um, still impacts us today. Well, the system really produced the state as the sovereign entity which controlled ultimately the use of force, which meant it was the ultimate arbiter. And state and international politics were governed by state-to-state -state relations. Now what's happened because of the diffusion of power and globalization, you have far more different groups that have usurped power. For example, the World Trade Organization, the European Union, to some degree the United Nations. And now you have groups like Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations <coughs> that have been able to exert their influence without having necessarily control of being a state. And so that's why the Westphalian system has been eroded and perhaps will be further eroded by this continuing uh, diffusion of power. You seem to be indicating that you believe that going into Iraq was the wrong thing to do. It was catastrophically stupid, and I said so at the time. Okay. And we knew better. And, and uh, I keep hearing about whack-a-mole. Yeah. And, and the reality is we went into Iraq because we wanted to be there for the long term, i.e. three generations. No, we didn't. had a beachhead in Iraq, which would eliminate this need for whacking a mole all the time. Could you explain your perspective on that? Uh, well, let me give you a different interpretation, which I think really fits the facts. Uh, September 11th caused an epiphany for George W. Bush. His administration was flailing, if you remember. It could not put its foot straight. Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, before September 11th, was on the verge of being fired because he was seen as inept, inept, clumsy, and the military hated him. Here's September 11th. I think George W. Bush had an epiphany. I, and he says so. He says, I have a higher father than <clears throat> my father. I think he saw this as an opportunity, quote, to change the geostrategic landscape of the Middle East. And I think he thought, pushed by Cheney, among others, that by democratizing Iraq, you would therefore save Israel, you would bring democracy to the region, it would spread, and it would end our problems. On top of that, Rumsfeld now saw transformation as a way to have a lighter footprint, get, get in, get out. If you read the war plan, which you can do to go to the George Washington National Security Archives called Operation Polo Step, we were going to be out of Iraq by December 2003. Nobody asked the question, what next? <clears throat> Lots of us did. Lots of us knew that there were no weapons. Curveball, even the Germans, the, the Germans are the ones who brought Curveball, who was this so-called Iraqi general who knew all this stuff, knew it was a fraud. But the administration really didn't care. They were not going in for weapons of mass destruction. That was the excuse. 
They were going in to democratize the Middle East on the grounds that they really thought this was going to work. And that's what happened. And they were dead wrong. And we're now stuck with that, on that legacy, unfortunately. But had they stayed for three generations, <coughs> do you think it would have worked? Um, I don't know that we had, I don't, I don't know that we had the capacity to stay for three generations. Um, <clears throat> unlike World War II, when we completely obliterated Germany and Japan, they were helpless. We could have done whatever we want. We took over the governance. We had a huge problem in Iraq. Mr. Maliki, he was diabolical, and the fact was that when he was in power, he caused the civil war. Now, if we had been more forceful, and we did so many stupid things. We disestablished the Iraqi army. We disestablished the Ba'athist party. I mean, this is criminal negligence. But then we let Maliki run. And once we did that, the tribal nature of Iraq, the Sunni-Shia split, the fact that the Shia wanted to get revenge for Saddam's uh, despotic Sunni rule <coughs> made it almost impossible for things to work. And we hadn't thought out what was going to happen. Uh, this was the biggest foreign policy disaster in my lifetime and probably since uh, the Civil War. And we're stuck with that legacy. And right now, there is really no good solution at hand. I want to uh, change slightly. Um, you were a friend of Benazar Bhutto. Talk to us about the consequences of her assassination and how you see Pakistan today. And then if you would follow that up by turning north to Russia and, uh, and, and Putin. Um, you will see on the back of my book, one of my uh, subscribers is uh, President, former president of Pakistan, Asif Zadari, who is Benazir's husband. Uh, Benazir is probably the most charismatic, articulate person I've ever met. She was magnificent. I knew her first when I was at graduate school and she was at Harvard. Uh, in a platonic sense, I love Benazir. She was terrific. She was assassinated on the 27th of December, uh, 2007. And as a result of that, Asif Zadari became president. And the trouble with Pakistan, which is a tragedy times 10 and it's getting worse, Pakistan is basically a feudal country that's been run by three and a half families. The army, the Bhutto Zadaris, the Sharifs, and the half family of the Chowdhury's who was the former chief judge. Right now, Pakistan has got 80 or 90 million people under the age of 20 with no jobs, no future, moving into the cities where they're radicalized. When Benazir Bhutto's father, Zulfiqar Bhutto, was prime minister and president, he took the economy of Pakistan, <coughs> which was flourishing, and nationalized it. And so he ruined the economy, and they've never recovered. This is 1970s. When General Zia became president, overthrew and killed Bhutto, he radicalized the country, imposed Sharia law, set up many of these thousands of madrasas which teach the most extreme means of, of radicalism. And so now you have in Pakistan a radical movement that believes in Sharia law. Uh, Salman Tazir was one of my closest friends who owns the, owned the Pakistani Daily Times. I still write for them. One of the most sophisticated people, one of the most forward-thinking people, whose father was a poet laureate and mother was English. And Salman was assassinated by his bodyguard, shot 20 times in AK-47 in Islamabad because Salman opposed the blasphemy laws and said putting a Christian woman to death <clears throat> for blasphemy in a Muslim world is outrageous. And his bodyguard was lauded and extolled as a hero for killing Salman because of his extreme views that way. So you've got radicalization. The country is running out of water, money, food. Um, and I think it is, and it, its government right now is incompetent. And so I'm extremely worried that <clears throat> the radicals who are growing, some of you may remember the attack on Mumbai a number of years ago, in which Lashkar e Taibi, which is a local uh, terrorist group that in fact was started by the ISI, the intelligence service, attacked Mumbai, killed hundreds of people, and almost started a war with India. Right now, you can bet that Taliban, that Al Qaeda, that the Islamic State are trying to plot something like that. And so Pakistan is probably the most dangerous part, potentially the most dangerous place in the world, because a war with India could, in fact, go nuclear. Uh, I'm not so much worried about the security of nuclear weapons. 
or nuclear weapons being sold to Saudi Arabia, but the country is failing and could implode. You take what's happening in Afghanistan, and make no mistake, Afghanistan is heading south. For all of his talents, Ashraf Ghani, who's a very good friend of mine, president, cannot control that particular country. And as we have pulled out, we've taken all the money with us, and Afghanistan is in worse shape now. Taliban are emerging. The country is becoming more and more divided. And if that gets worse, it will impact on Pakistan. And if the Islamic State spreads, we're going to have real problems. So we need to do far more. The good news, however, the good news, the Russians are now becoming more engaged in Pakistan. Thank goodness. Because the Pakistani, I'm, I mean that. Um, I have a lot of experience with the Pakistan army. I used to go out in the field. It made me cry to see these kids, some of them without boots, not very well armed. They only have a handful of helicopters, army of half a million. Half of them don't fly. And so the Russians are going to be providing them the helicopters that we could not. I mean, I was outraged that we did not give substantial enough military aid. We couldn't do the right things, and I worked very, very, very hard with John Kerry. It was just impossible. That was an opportunity that was gone. Now, Mr. Putin, uh, about Ukraine. <clears throat> Question, will the United States and NATO go to war over Ukraine? Anybody say yes? Of course not. Ukraine is far more important to Mr. Putin than it is to us. Anybody know what I mean by interior lines of communication in warfare? Okay, it means you're close. How far is Russia from Ukraine? There. How far are we from Ukraine and how do we get stuff in? Now, the argument to rearm Ukraine has got noble sentiment. You can understand you want to help the poor Ukrainians because they're undergunned, so forth and so on. But if we arm them, the Russians can out-escalate. Now, I think, and I had hoped that, I didn't say, I shouldn't say hope, this truce is really a function of Mr. Putin. If Putin really wants a truce, we'll get one. We have not, by we, the President of the United States, and so far Secretary of State John Kerry, has not, have not cornered Mr. Putin and said, what are your objectives in Ukraine? What do you want? We've threatened him. We told him, don't do this. It's really stupid. We haven't asked what he wants. I can make a case that Putin says, I can really push NATO. I've got a real advantage here. I'm not going to give in. And in fact, I hope that the Americans arm the Ukrainians, because how long is it going to take for us to get weapons to them? We still can't get weapons to the Kurds. It's going to be months before we get stuff to them. So it's going to make no difference. They're going to out-escalate. Putin could also then threaten the flanks of NATO, and he has a huge advantage. While we have a nuclear arms agreement that limits both sides to 1,550 strategic warheads, Putin has about 10 times more short-range nuclear weapons than we do. And all he's got to do is flex his muscles. Now, what might that also have as a secondary consequence? It might affect the price of oil. So I can construct a scenario where Putin decides he wants to have a crisis and really push NATO to help divide the alliance and to raise the price of oil. Now, this might become more of a Hollywood movie than a reality. <laughs> but the only two people I know who know Putin well are Colin Powell and Henry Kissinger. And Kissinger probably knows Putin better than any other American. And they have the same thing to say. This is a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He has a mindset, and he's tough. And I don't think that we have been able. The reset button was nice and noble, but we did not really know how to engage Russia. We delegitimized them. We didn't give them, the, despite the phrase that we're going to give them lots of dignity, we never did it. Now, I'm not blaming us. I, even though we were part of the problem. But we didn't know how to deal with Putin, and we still don't. So I think the situation is going to be, unless by some miracle there's a truce, the war will continue. The eastern part of Ukraine de facto will be closer to Russia. Putin may or may not decide to precipitate a crisis with NATO. And our solution is not to arm Ukraine. Our solution is to strengthen NATO. We didn't do it sufficiently during the NATO summit in September in Wales. We need to do it right now. And it's not just saying we're going to reinforce Article 5. Article 5 is the bedrock of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. An attack against one is an attack against all. We need to fortify the flanks. We need to give them more weapons such as stingers, uh, anti-air weapons, anti-ground weapons, um, and reinforce them so that if the Russians are going to send little green men into Latvia or Estonia or Romania, 
that they get badly blooded as the Soviet Union did in the winter war against Finland in 1939. And I think we've got to be a lot tougher with bear bombers that are flying without transponders over the North Sea uh, and the English Channel. And I wouldn't mind illuminating them with fire control radars to say, you better turn your transponder on or we may take action. I would be much more aggressive to show to Putin we can't be pushed around. The last question has to do with, and let me just say, um, Dr. Ullman will be around, so if you have follow-up questions, I know Well, I wasn't him. planning to die. No, well, I mean, <laughs> you're going to stay around here. Yeah. But the last question is, again, about, about the Ukraine. Given the de facto situation in the eastern part of the country, 90% yeah. Russian speaking, right. television, newspapers, magazines, why doesn't the president of the Ukraine just give that part of the Ukraine to the Soviet Union? To the Russians. To the Russians, rather. To the Russians. And, and since it, the rest of the country is westward looking, and let that part of what was Ukraine flourish, is there any reason to do that or even yeah. to suggest it? <clears throat> well, it's, it's a logical conclusion that it may well be a de facto partition, uh, 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 divert, div division of the country. That could well happen. The trouble is that the economics are such it makes it extremely difficult. Uh, you really just, it's like Solomonian judgment, I'll cut the baby in half. It would not be necessarily a, working, a workable situation, but federation makes more sense. That was really the big difference between the Minsk agreement of last week and the one in September. And we'll see what happens. Um, at some stage, I think the economic, let me make another point. I have argued in my book that I think Putin's days are numbered. I shouldn't say days, but months or years. Uh, he has made a solemn promise to the Russians he's going to turn the economy around in two years. There's no chance he can do that. It's going to get worse. So my guess is in about three or four years, the Russians are going to have had enough. I mean, you can only starve and beat the Russians so much, and they can only love their czar so much. And I think that the uh, oligarchs are going to take over, and I think Putin has got uh, a limited. Whether he realizes that or not, I have no idea because his popularity is still 90%. But we have not been very good with our PR. <clears throat> and I, I just don't think the president has played Putin right. You can't threaten him. You've got to push him with the right questions. What is it you want? And unfortunately, we have not done that. Uh, will there be a crisis? It could be worse. But we can reinforce NATO. And you've got to realize and what John McCain said has got some truth to it. Uh, Russia is a gas station with nuclear weapons. And they've got huge problems, declining population, uh, an average age life expectancy of less than 60. I mean, they got a real series of problems that they're not going to get over. And at some stage, it's going to make a difference. Uh, but this is not, my book was about 1914. <laughs> this is not 1914. This is not 1939. You're not going to be drafted to go fight a war. The downside is that we are losing terrific opportunities for a safer and more stable world. There's not Armageddon. There's going to be terrorism. There'll be more attacks. But we had Sandy Point in which kids get killed, so forth and so on. They're probably going to be on the margin. We're probably going to overreact. Our standard of living is going to decline. Expectations, OK, we can live with that. But what we're really missing is the opportunity to restore America's promise. And that's my message to you all. Your generation is going to have that responsibility. And I've got so great confidence yeah. that you will. Let me just say this. This will be on YouTube tonight. So I'm going to uh, suggest to the president that he find some time to listen to this extraordinary, really, truly extraordinary uh, presentation by the man I think is, knows more about, about foreign policy than just about anybody in our country. You've been absolutely wonderful, Dr. Ullman. Thank you George, so much. George, a great thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys take my message seriously, please. And this is the book. I have a couple of books. He'll, uh, there's some left. If you want to buy a book, he'll be happy to sign. And they're they're only $500 a piece. They're all collector's <laughs> edition. And, uh, and there will be time for the follow-up. But let's have him go to the table outside first so he can sign the book. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Chris Schaefer. Go ahead. <laughs>